A few hundred years ago, in the city of Prague, there was a huge marketplace where everybody would come, do all their shopping, and get everything that they needed. There was a Jewish man in the market who used to sell olive oil, and everybody used to buy their olive oil from this fellow. He was making a lot of money, he had the best product, and business kept booming for this guy. Next door to him was a fellow who was not Jewish. He used to sell spices, and business for him wasn't as great as the business was for the Jewish fellow next door to him. Deep down, it always bothered him, but he never opened his mouth, and they always lived together in peace. Baruch Hashem. However, one day, in the middle of the afternoon, in the old days, people used to close their stores to go home for lunch, or whatever it may be, and all the stores were closed. The Jewish fellow would close the store as well, but he would never go home. He would count the money that he made. He would restock. He would always be busy in the store because he was such a busy store and he needed to supply everyone with all their olive oil needs. One day, the non-Jewish fellow next door was dying to know what does the Jewish fellow do during the day during the break, when everyone closes up their shop and they go home, he decided that he's going to stay and he's going to peek. In the old days, there were no cement walls in between the stores like we have today. They had curtains in between, like a market in Eretz Yisrael and similar places. So as everyone closed and the Jewish fellow closed the store, but he stayed inside, the fellow next door, the non-Jew, starts to peek through the curtain without anyone realizing what he's doing, especially the Jew, so he could spy on what the Jewish person did on his lunch break. He realizes when he looks through that the Jewish man is counting gold coins, coin after coin after coin, putting them into a red velvet bag with a zipper on it and he's counting with his mouth and you could hear him talk and say the numbers that he's counting. He's counting 200, 250. Finally he's getting up to 300 gold coins. The non-Jew is watching and he cannot believe how many gold coins this Jewish fellow has he counted together with him at the end, and when he got up to 300, the Jewish man closes his red velvet pouch, and the non-Jew couldn't help it. He had to think of a plan how he's going to get that red pouch with all those 300 gold coins that are in it. He knows how many coins are in there because the Jew is moving his mouth and counting, and now he can make a plan and make believe that the gold coins in that pouch belong to him. He quickly rips open the curtain, grabs the red pouch from the Jewish man, and runs onto the street. The Jewish man didn't even realize what's going on. It took him a second to comprehend what was happening, and he realized that the non-Jew took his gold coins and ran into the street. He chases after the spice salesman to get his gold coins back. He caught up to him and he starts screaming and he tries to get the red pouch filled with the 300 gold coins out of the hands of the spice salesman. He's pulling and pulling but the spice fellow would not let go. They're screaming, both of them, and police start to come. The Jewish man starts to tell the police, these are my coins. He's stealing my bag from me filled with gold coins. But the spice guy was a little audacious, a lot audacious. And he starts to tell the police that the coins are his and the Jewish fellow is stealing it from him. Unfortunately, in the old days, the police would always side with the non-Jew especially because he said, I know exactly how many coins are in here. Your officer, please, there's 300 gold coins inside of this bag. The police hear, and they hear the Jewish guy, 
and they didn't know what to do. The Jewish guy couldn't believe that he knew how many coins are in his bag. He said, you were peeking as I was counting my coins? And the non-Jew said, absolutely not. They're my coins. You were peeking on me. And they were pulling and pulling. And finally the police confiscate the bag and tell both of them, if you want this bag of gold coins, we're going to have to go through a system of the court. And the judge will decide who the coins belong to. The Jewish man was so sad. It was a huge fortune amount of money. The spice fellow was so happy that he probably knew he was going to win and get all these coins. They're following the police officers to the precinct. Each one is sad on the outside, but the non-Jew was not sad on the inside because he knew that they weren't his. But the Jewish person couldn't believe what happened to his coins, that the fellow next door that he lived in peace with all these years would finally do something so bad, so horrible to him. They get to the precinct and the police take the coins and put it in the safe. They go in front of a judge and the judge says, next week, exactly this time and this day, we're going to have a court case and we're going to see who the coins belong to. He dismissed them from the precinct, but little by little, the entire town started to hear what was going on with this story between the man who sells the olive oil and the man who sells the spices. And because the olive oil fellow was Jewish and the spice man was not Jewish, little by little, there was a split in the entire city. It was literally all the non-Jews, the Goyim, getting upset at the Jewish people. How could it be that a Jew would take the money from our friend, the spice guy? But the Jewish people knew deep down exactly what had happened, that the olive oil man used to make a lot of money, and they knew it was his, and they knew that he was framed, and this was going to be a terrible story in this city. Every newspaper in town was writing on this story. Every person in the streets was discussing this story. What's going to happen next week when there's a court case? And it was getting very bad. The non-Jews were so upset at the Jewish people. They said, if the spice fellow, the non-Jew, wins this court case, that means that they could go against the Jewish people. Has v'shalom. The Jewish people were hoping for the best, praying that everything should finish in peace. The judge who was going to judge this case was very, very nervous. He didn't know what to say. He saw the tension in the city. He saw that it was literally a silent war between the non-Jews and the Jewish people. What's going to be? Whatever side he says, he's in trouble, most probably. He's going to have to prove it. But how do you prove it? One says the gold coins are his. One says the gold coins are his. And there's no way of proving it. He couldn't sleep at night. He was a nervous, nervous wreck. He would stroll during the day, trying to think of an idea how he's going to make the decision in this court case. And like we said, the whole entire town was waiting for the moment. The pressure was on, and the judge felt the pressure for the moment of truth in the court's decision. The day before the court case came, the judge was so nervous. He decided to take a walk. He couldn't even concentrate. He's trying to think of an idea, but nothing was popping into his head. How do you think of an idea when you just see two sides with no evidence whatsoever? He walked so far without even realizing where he went that he ended up in the Jewish neighborhood of the city. He gets to the park for the children in the middle of the town. And there was a bench. He decided to sit down to try to clear his mind. The children were all running around, playing on the swings and the sliding ponds and whatever games they would play. 
He didn't even pay attention to them, obviously because his mind is so occupied with what is going on. While the children are playing, there was one boy. His name was Yehuda. He was approximately nine or ten years old. And he was so smart, he knew exactly who that man sitting on the bench was. It was the judge. The boy was so wise, he knew what was going on in the city, and he knew about the court case the next day. The boy, because he was so smart, he even knew how he's going to save the day. But who's going to listen to a nine-year-old boy? So he decided to play a game with his friends in front of the judge, hoping the judge will see and get an idea how he could prove who the gold coins really and truly belong to. He tells his friends, guys, I'm not in the mood to play cops and robbers anymore. I want to play something else. And the judge really isn't paying attention. He says, I want to play court case. And I want to be the judge. The second the court, the judge hears that, he hears the word court, he hears the word ju judge, he opens his eyes and he starts to pay attention. What is this boy doing? What are these kids doing? Let me watch. Who knows what could happen? And he's watching the children. And little Yehuda, the smartest boy in town, he says, I'm going to be the judge and we're going to play court and we're going to play the story of the olive oil man and the spice man who claim that each one owns the gold coins in that red pouch. On one hand, the judge looks at this boy and he couldn't believe how smart he is that he knows about the current, current events in the town. But on the other hand, the judge got even more nervous. How could it be that even the little kids know all the details? That means the pressure is even greater than I thought. The little boy Yehuda tells his friends, you be policeman number one, you be policeman number two, and he tells one friend, you'll be the olive oil guy, and you'll be the spice man. And they start playing, and he tells the olive oil bo boy, he tells him, I want you to tell me your story. And the kid starts acting, and the judge is watching, all mesmerized that he can't believe the kids know all these details. And the boy playing the olive oil man starts to say, I had my money and my gold coins and it was my savings and I was counting it and he looked through the curtain to see how much I have. The judge is watching and he's like, whoa. And then the spice guy gets his turn to talk. And the judge tells him, let me hear what you have to say. And he says, I don't even make a lot of money, but I was saving up and that's what I do during my lunch break and it's my money and the Jewish guy stole it from me. The judge is watching and he wants to hear what little Yehuda has to say. Little Yehuda says, okay, we heard the olive oil guy say his story. We heard the spice guy say his story. Now it's time to hear what the coins have to say. The judge heard that and he says, oh, they're just playing make-believe. I'm going to get up and go. The judge stands up and he starts to walk away. But little Yehuda wanted him to hear what he was thinking. He tells one of the friends even louder, the police officer number one, I want you to go in my safe and get me the gold coins. I want to hear what they have to say. He tells police officer number two, I want you to go to the kitchen in the courthouse and get me a pot of boiling hot water. Now the judge, he stops in his tracks and he listens to what the boy has to say. He turns around and he thinks the boy has a great idea. One of the boys start carrying, making believe he's carrying a pot of hot water. And the other boy, police number one, brings the gold coins, a bunch of pebbles, making believe they're the coins, to give to the judge. The judge takes the pebbles, puts it in the make-believe pot, and he tells everyone, all his friends, guys, don't you see who the coins belong to? You see, and his friends don't even know what he's getting to. 
But the judge, the real judge, is looking and he cannot believe how smart this boy is. The boy continues and he said, ladies and gentlemen, don't you see all the olive oil that floated to the top of the pot of hot water? When I put these gold coins in, there was olive oil on every coin. The hot water made the olive oil be removed from the coin. And as we know, oil floats to the top. And look at all this olive oil. That's a proof that it belongs to the olive oil man and not the fellow who sells the spices. The judge starts to sing, starts to dance, goes over to the boy, hugs him with all his might. He says, who are you? What are you? You saved the day. The next day, the courthouse is filled. Thousands of people, news reporters, everyone was there. All the non-Jews were getting ready to prove that, look, the Jewish people steal from the non-Jews. And they were upset and they couldn't wait for the judge to say his judgment. The Jewish people were all there too, wanting to see what the verdict of the judge is going to be. Who knows? And they were praying that there would be peace and calm in the town after the verdict of the judge, no matter what. Everyone knew how much pressure this judge had and how nervous he was. But believe it or not, when he walks into the courtroom and everyone stands up, the judge seemed calm and he seemed all perfect as if nothing is wrong. They couldn't believe how calm he looked. He sits down and he asks for order in the court. And even though there were thousands of people in the hallways, out the windows, all there, they all were quiet as soon as as the judge said, order in the court. The judge calls the olive oil man, and this time it's for real. Obviously, it's not playtime. And he tells him, please tell us your story. And the olive oil fellow tells his entire story to everybody listening. The judge says, okay, I heard you. You could sit down now. Then he calls the spice fellow. And the man who sells the spices comes up and he starts dramatizing and crying. It was my life savings, hoping that his drama would change the judge's mind and he'll win the case and get all those gold coins for not even working for them. And he finishes his story and he tells the spice fellow, now it's time for you to sit down, please. Everyone's waiting. What is the judge going to say? The judge says, I heard what the olive oil man said. I heard what the spice man said. And now it's time to listen what the gold coins have to say. Everyone's looking at him like that's the most ridiculous thing we ever heard. Obviously, coins can't say. He does tell the police officer, go get me the coins from the safe. And he tells the assistant that's in the courtroom, please get me a pot of boiling water from the coffee room that's in the courthouse. No one understood what he was doing, but little by little, people started to realize the judge knows exactly what he's doing. They bring the coins and they bring the pot of boiling water. The judge takes the red pouch, opens up the zipper, and pours all the gold coins into the boiling water. In one second, all the oil that were on the coins floated to the top and there was a huge amount of oil that was on top of the boiling water in the pot. The judge didn't even have to talk. He just called the spice fellow and the olive oil fellow to come see. And the second the spice fellow saw all that oil, his face turns red from embarrassment. The judge announces to the entire courthouse and all the people listening that there is so much oil in here that is obvious that it was on the hands of the fellow who sold 
olive oil and he counted his coins one by one and that's why there's so much olive oil in this pot he punished the spice fellow for lying and because he proved it so obvious everyone realized that the judge was very smart in his verdict of saying that the coins belong to the Jewish man who sells the olive oil because it was so obvious and because he proved it so perfectly everyone especially the non-Jews realized that they better not make any trouble because it is obvious that it belonged to the Jewish people and Baruch Hashem the Jewish people were all calm that they know they weren't proved wrong and they will all live in peace after everyone was smiling and mesmerized at the judge's wisdom he asked for order in the court one more time and he announces to everyone to tell you the truth ladies and gentlemen for an entire week I couldn't sleep I was nervous I did not know what to do and yesterday I went for a stroll and he told everybody the story he said I needed to clear my mind and there was a little boy his name was Yehuda his last name is Loi and he was playing with his friends and I got the obvious idea from him so really it's not me that made this verdict it's not me that made the decision and made peace in this town but it is all accredited to that little boy Yehuda everyone starts clapping the boy wasn't even there that boy ended up growing up to be a huge huge Tamir Chacham a huge Sadiq a huge chief rabbi his name was the Maharal from Prague and his entire life the police always respected him and realized how wise he is till today in the city of Prague there's a statue of the Maharal from Prague because of his wisdom in that town as we learn about the Tzadikim we realize how great they are we learn a few things number one when we hear a Tzadik's name we realize how wise they were but number two he was a young boy just like us we could be a young boy or a young girl and we could grow up to be just as great as these Tzadikim have a happy holiday and a great day